My name is Anamina Reeder. I am a researcher and lecturer at the University of St. Gallen, and in today's video, we're going to look into digital nudging. After watching this video, you will be able to answer the following questions. Why is nudging in digital environments relevant? What are digital nudges and where can they be used? What is the purpose behind digital nudges? Let's start with a close up on digital choice environments and what makes them so special. The ubiquity of technology in our everyday lives has led to a drastic increase of the numbers of decisions we make in digital environments. Many behaviors and decision situations have been around even before the internet era. We've always been shopping, investing, looking for intimate partners or booking our travels. So these decision situations are not new per se, but have been replicated in the online environment. Having more available options in one marketplace, of course, gives us more options to choose from, but also more information to take into consideration that we base our decision on. While our local shoe store had three pairs of white sneakers in our size, online commerce may offer hundreds of white sneakers, maybe even reduced outlet or secondhand sneakers. So the tendency that we can observe is clearly an exponential expansion of the available information. If we look at our cognitive capacities, we must note that they have hardly changed over hundreds of years. Well, up to a certain point, of course, additional options and information will help us make better decisions and find more suitable options. Once the information load passes our intellectual power, this will impair the quality of our decisions. This is because the information flood overcharges our cognitive capacity, which leaves us in a state that is called information overload. In an information overload, we're unable to process the information available to us and thus rely on our intuition and use mental shortcuts to come to a decision. Looking at what is going on between our two modes of thinking, we can see that in such situations, system two is overcharged by the available information, and we tend to rely more heavily on system one to support our decision-making processes, which unsurprisingly results in lower decision quality. To prevent this from happening, scholars in different disciplines have put forth a variety of approaches to support human decision-making and to improve decision quality. Prominent concepts include persuasive technology, digital nudging, and gamification. Despite being frequently used interchangeably, they focus on different angles and rely on different strategies to obtain similar outcomes. Gamification seeks to exploit elements from game design, for example, competitions, leaderboards, transparency of progress, and reward structures to alternatively motivate people to engage in a specific behavior. In contrast, persuasive technology and digital nudging are more superordinate approaches to influence behavior. They refer to information technology or elements of it that aim to alter human behavior or attitudes in a predefined way. While persuasive technology is a broader concept, digital nudges are simple elements of user interfaces rather than entire applications or systems. Let's have a closer look at what digital nudges are and what they do. To put it simply, digital nudging transfers the principles of nudging to the digital sphere. Digital nudges are any user interface design element that utilize or counteract psychological effects with the goal of influencing users' decision in a predetermined way without forbidding any options, significantly changing economic incentives or providing relevant argumentation. So just like in the general nudging approach, the goal is to alter elements of the decision environment in such a way that psychological effects are used to shape behavior. The major difference is that the decision environment is a digital one now. For example, a website or a mobile app or some sort of workplace software. According to this logic, the nudge, which is the element that we manipulate in nudging, is an element of the user interface in digital nudging. 
What is important to note is that digital nudges are restricted to elements of the user interface, which is the surface structure of an information system. Anything that would require significant backend capacity, that is the deep structure of information systems, does not fall within the scope of nudging anymore. This would rather be a new feature then. Why it is important to restrict digital nudges to user interface design element becomes clear if we look into the advantages of digital nudging in general and as compared to physical nudging. Since we're manipulating the surface structure, implementing digital nudges is usually fast and cost efficient. Same goes for adjusting them. Next, and this is a characteristic unique to the digital space, we may personalize nudges to groups of users or even individual users if we have the possibility to trace their behaviors and recognize who we're dealing with. For example, if we know that one user is more susceptible to social norm content, the message of the digital nudge may differ from the one that we display to our users that are more likely to respond to content activating loss aversion. What's more, social media enables new opportunities for creating social transparency. So harnessing social norms and related heuristics is much easier and at the same time much more powerful because we may incorporate the social references that are actually relevant to someone rather than some random social reference. Last, monitoring success and evaluating effectiveness is much easier in the digital environment since we may track user behavior and leverage techniques from user experience design, like A-B tests. But even if we wish to go down the scientific road, conducting online experiments is just so much more convenient than a large scale lab experiment. Now let's look at how digital nudges can be applied. Of course, when thinking about digital nudges, the first thing that comes to our mind is some sort of overwhelming, chaotic, flashing booking website or recommendations based on what others bought from an online commerce website. But digital nudges is not restricted to online commerce. In fact, the B2C context is probably the one in which the use of nudges is most controversial and in which they must be used very cautiously to respect user interests and to preserve freedom of choice. What is often overlooked is that not only consumers can be users. In our other roles as employees or citizens, we interact with technologies just as frequently, and there is plenty of room for improving these interactions. Most importantly, it is usually not very critical to align the goals of an organization with those of an individual employee, whereas in the relationship with consumers or citizens, ethical considerations may be trickier. Generally, it is important to remember that the purpose of digital nudges should be to improve users interaction with the user interface and not to get them to act in a way that benefits the organization. These two examples show how this can be achieved in different contexts. Top right is from Airbnb that uses star ratings by guests to increase trust in offers on its platform and to facilitate decision making. So, of course, a booking benefits Airbnb as an organization, but selecting a good offer and not falling for a scam is highly beneficial for the user too. The other one is from Outlook that reminds users if they forget to fill the subject line of an email. This can be annoying, of course, but if I'm sending an important email to my superior, adding a subject may actually increase my chances of getting the reply I was hoping for. Another good example is the fitness app Runtastic, which uses digital nudges in abundance to encourage users' continuous engagement and physical activity. On the left, we can see some attempts to harness social influence, potentially even image motivation. And then we have push notifications that give feedback to create positive reinforcement and that remind users to do some exercise using availability heuristic. And our example is from Square, which is a payment app that uses nudges to maximize tips. On the screenshot to the right, we can see three default percentages. Of course, we're still able to customize the amount or not to tip at all, but given the status quo bias, we're more likely to pick one of the defaults. Taken together with the central tendency bias that is rooted in the anchoring effect, 
most probably we're going to select the 20% option. As we consider using digital nudges on our own user interface, it may be tempting to copy and paste nudges that have been in use elsewhere. Since decision environments and decision-making processes are very context dependent, adopting best practices rarely works out. Also, most websites do not report on the nudges they use and whether they have been successful, so it is really hard to tell best practice apart from common practice. So if you consider using digital nudges, you'll be well advised to put in some extra effort to analyze the goals, behaviors, and constraints that your users face in detail. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you're interested in this topic and want to know more about it, I've linked further readings and references in the description below. Thanks for watching.